Our first lesson comes from Acts chapter 7, beginning with verse 54. When the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this they covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices, they rushed at him, dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. And while they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Then Saul approved of their killing him. And on that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church, and going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. The word of the Lord. Our second reading is from Psalm 80, beginning with verse 17. Let your hand rest on the man at your right hand. The son of man you have raised up for yourselves. Then we will not turn away from you. Revive us and we will call your name. Restore us, Lord God Almighty. Make your face shine on us that we may be saved. So Lutheran aerobics, please stand for the reading of the gospel. Gospel readings found in the book of Luke chapter 24, beginning with verse 50. When he had led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands and Jesus blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. Then they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and they stayed continually at the temple praising God. The gospel of the Lord. All right, please be seated and let's, let's pray. Lord Jesus, this morning I ask that you would, like you did with uh, Cleopas and all the followers on the day of resurrection, would open our minds to your word, Lord God, to see you in your word and your plan for us. Lord Jesus, fill us with your Holy Spirit and bring your word to life, life in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, I, uh, I'm not going to read the gospel over again, so we can skip that, but uh, we just read it. And I, what, I, what I get excited about when I get to the end of the, the gospel of Luke is that it's not an ending. It's a segue. And I say the word segue and everybody under 40 means, you mean a hoverboard with, one of, with handles? Those don't move me, by the way, there anyway. But uh, what a segue is, is a segue moves the story forward. And so what's happening here at the end of Luke is Jesus has blessed his disciples. He has ascended. They, they are carrying their blessing with him, and the story moves forward. It's God's big story moving forward forward. And that's what we are. That's where we are. We're a new part of God's big story. It's not new to God. He knows what's going to happen. It's new to us. And so he is risen. So let's do that again. He is risen. Hope is rising. He is risen. 
because Jesus is making all things new. That is resurrection power. Jesus is making all things new. The very moment that Jesus was raised, he is starting off this chain reaction of making all things new. He, last week, Pastor James talked about the walk to Emmaus and how Jesus met with Cleopas and, and another guy that we don't know his name, but throughout that walk, he opened up their minds to the scriptures. They, and then they recognized him in the breaking of bread. Their minds were beginning to be transformed. We talked on Easter about having a new mindset, not a flesh mindset, not a dead mindset, not a world mindset, but a kingdom mindset that is a Holy Spirit mindset. And so Jesus starts this happening the moment that he's risen from the dead. He meets with his disciples at the end of of Luke. He says, here I am. Come and hang on to me. I'm not a spirit. He says, you have anything to eat? He eats in front of them. And then he opens their minds, the transformation of the mind to all of the scriptures. It says the law of Moses, which is the Torah, the Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, all the prophets and the Psalms even. And so the Psalm we are going to look at again today, that is a prophetic Psalm about Jesus Christ. And he's opening their minds up to it. He's transforming them because he's making all things new. And that's what happens because Jesus is risen. He is risen. Hope is rising. He's making all things new. So he blesses them and their lives are changed and we know that their lives are changed because they acted pretty much the same way for the three years that they walked with Jesus. But after he's risen, they start to really radically transform. They are changed. And this is cool because in Christ... There are no limits. In Jesus Christ, there are no limits. When we worship him, when we go where he sends us with great joy, when we're continually praising God, and all of that is laying down our lives, by the way. His blessing remains on us and with us, and his purpose, his big story, cannot be stopped. And I, that is so important. I want you guys to know and to believe and to hope that his plan, his big story can't be stopped. For the last year plus, everything tries to stop, has been trying to stop. Stop, 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 stop. Stop worshiping. Stop what, all this stuff, okay? God's plan cannot be stopped. And Satan tries to stop it. The enemy tries to stop us from being part of God's perfect plans. Think about how the Bible describes the enemy of God, the enemy of the people that God loves. He's like a lion roaring, seeking whom he may devour. He is, has come to kill and steal and destroy. He is a, the, a liar and the father of lies. Everything he does is about trying to stop God's plan, but Every time the enemy comes after the people of God who have laid down their lives for God. Again, the difference between what happens in the world when conflict comes, when tragedy happens, when pandemics, all those things happen. The difference between that and when it happens to the people of God who have laid down their lives for Jesus Christ is when the enemy who can't help himself, he's predatorial, comes after the people of God who've laid down their lives. It's, it's like when a, a, a predatorial fish goes after a piece of bait and he swallows the hook. He can't help himself, and he gets the hook. He tries, he takes a bite. He thinks he's going to eat us alive, but he's the one that gets the hook because you cannot stop God's plan. His plans get destroyed, not God's plans when he comes after pe the people who love Jesus so much that they've laid down their lives already. In Acts, we see this happening again and again. Starting with Acts 2, what happens, right? Jesus promises the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes on at Pentecost. The followers of Jesus start spreading out, speaking, preaching the good news, leading people to never 
ending unbreakable relationships with God through Jesus Christ. Miracles are happening. And we, we call the book of Acts the Acts of the Apostles, but what it really is, is it's the Acts of the Holy Spirit moving through the Apostles. Because all of this power stuff is happening, and it hasn't stopped, by the way. I'm one of those guys that says it has not stopped. And Satan can't stand what's going on. So he picks two of what he thinks is Jesus' most vulnerable, vulnerable, say that ten times fast, vulnerable disciples and apostles. He goes after Peter and John. And you remember the night that Jesus was arrested. Peter's supposed to be a leader, but what does he do? He denies Christ three times, right? And John is the beloved disciple. He's the one that Jesus really has this special relationship with. And what happens when Jesus is arrested? John takes off. He runs away. A guard catches his little loincloth and he runs off naked. So Satan picks on those two. And this is how much they've changed since the night that Jesus was arrested. Because when they're arrested and when they're beaten and when they're threatened, they go back, when they're released and they go back to the other disciples, they celebrate it. They're happy that they got to suffer for Jesus. Their minds have been transformed because they've already started laying down their lives for him. They've done it. And if you lay down your life for Jesus, then you've got nothing to lose. If you're already dead, what do you have to lose? Because you gave up your death for the life that Jesus Christ and only Jesus can give you. Enemy tries to stop us. He takes a bite, but he gets the hook. And so what happens then is these guys are so on a new level, right, that they, they suffering for Jesus, they want more. When our love for Jesus is a lay down your life love, and I'll do anything for you love, that is a blessed by Jesus, empowered by the Holy Spirit, hope is rising love that cannot be stopped. And so these guys go back and they actually pray for more of this to happen. Now how crazy in love with somebody do you have to be where you just got beat up and threatened for the name of the person that you're in love with and you want more? It's a change of mind. And so in Acts 4, I love this. It says, this is their prayer after all this happens. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Don't, you know, it's, it's not hide us, protect us. Make us invisible, you know. Give us a place to run. It's none of that. Enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. More love, more power, more of you in our lives. And Jesus gives them more. And after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. He keeps giving when we ask for more. Because once we're surrendered, we're vessels that can be filled with his Holy Spirit, overflowing, filled and poured out, filled and poured out again and again and again. God's purpose is fulfilled with his blessing by people who are happy to lay down their lives for Jesus because they love him so much. When we're sold out for Jesus Christ, when we're so in love with him, that we would lay down our lives for him, then Jesus saves and he restores and everything the enemy tries to kill and still and destroy, Jesus saves and restores. Nothing is lost. Nothing is lost. 
In Psalm 80, this, this is the, the psalm is about all of this hardship that Israel has suffered. But their hope is in this prophesied king who's going to sit at the right hand of God. So let's look at that. Psalm 80. And it's the Lord they're talking to. God, let your hand rest on the man at your right hand, the son of man you have raised up for yourself. Who's that? It's Jesus. Sitting at the right hand of the father, risen from the dead, conqueror of death, conqueror of sin, conqueror of any thing that we have to be afraid of sitting at the right hand of the father and when we turn to him and we celebrate him and we rejoice over what he gives to us his face shines on us no matter what the world throws at us no matter what the enemy throws at us no matter how hard it bites we should never lose hope because something bad happens or because there's a conflict in the church or because of something our health takes a turn, or be, what, there's, n- there's nothing that the world or the enemy can throw at us that should cause us to lose hope because our hope is not in comfort. Our hope is not in pleasure. Our hope is not in, a, in plenty or in perfect health or in a perfect church. You know, there's not going to be a perfect church until Jesus comes again. And I'm one of those guys, when I was a little kid, I always kind of liked to flip to the end of the story. See what was going to happen. Any of you guys do that? Have you looked at the end of the book? All right. Just to clue you in, the end of the book says that until Jesus comes again, it's not exactly going to be a pleasure cruise. Our hope is not in comfort. Our hope is in Jesus. Our joy is in loving God and loving one another with him. And when the enemy bites, we don't buckle, we get bold. Because we know that the saving face of Jesus Christ is shining on us. In Acts 5, think, talking about the church now. Acts 5 and 6, just a couple of quick tags here. The first thing Satan did to try to destroy the church had to do with lies about money. Does that sound familiar? He keeps using the same tricks over and over and over again. And the difference is that this early church was so sold out for Jesus, so already have given their lives for Jesus, so filled with the Holy Spirit that the the lie of the enemy about Ananias and Sapphira, you go look at that in Acts 5. It didn't get anywhere. And the power of God was revealed in a really big, powerful way. And the result of that was not only did the church, that early church, respect the power of God even more, but everybody respected the power of God even more. And they had even more freedom to preach the word of God with boldness. In Acts 6, See if this sounds familiar. Satan tried to divide the early church over prejudice. That never happens. This group taking offense about that group and that person taking offense about this person. And that. But they were so sold out for Jesus, so in love with him. They had already laid down their lives. It wasn't about him, them, it was about him. And so Satan bit, but he got the hook because what happened was then the church ended up raising up more leaders in the church. Stephen was one of those leaders. More people got served, more people got taken care of, and the apostles were free to spend all of their time preaching and praying like Jesus wanted them to do. Because they were totally and completely in love with Jesus Christ. And we get to Stephen. And Stephen is this guy that everybody loves and respects. I wish I could see him. It says that he had the face of an angel. 
He was one of these leaders that was helping serve all these people. And Satan said, okay, I'm going to take this one out. So he fired up the Sanhedrin and Stephen was tried and there, it was all lies, all these lies. And he made this, he kind of convicted them. He said something true about them and they, they went insane and they rushed him and they stoned him to death. And we can get upset about that. It's okay to mourn for people that we lose because we love them. But we have to remember that, that Stephen had already laid down his life for Jesus Christ. And if Satan attacks somebody who's already laid down his life, he may take a bite, but he's going to get the hook. And I want you to see what happens with all this. Stephen was totally in love with Jesus. He'd already given up his life for Jesus. He was half, happy to suffer for Christ. Even death, facing death, he was so full of love for Jesus and so excited to see him that he had no fear of death. When you already lay down your life, you're not, you, don't, you don't have to be afraid. It's, it's wonderful not to ever to be afraid. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God. And Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Think of the psalm, right? Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Even as he's dying, he's so in love with Jesus. And think about the transformation of his mind. He's become so filled with the spirit of Jesus Christ that as he's dying, it sounds a lot like what Jesus was talking about when he was dying on the cross. And so while he's dying, he's praying for forgiveness for the people who are murdering him. That is a different mindset. That's a kingdom mindset. That's a Jesus mindset. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees. He cried out, Lord do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. This is the mindset of a person who's totally and completely in love with Jesus. And when Satan goes after people like this, who've given up their lives for him, they, he gets the hook every time. And I want you to think about the, the events now, the chain of events that happen because this, this one already laid down his life for Jesus. In Acts 8, 1, Saul approved of their killing him. So now we have the mindset of Paul, of Saul, also known as Paul. Paul's his Roman name. We'll come back to that. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. So here's this predatorial animal that's come in for the kill. It's like a barracuda you know, going for a school of fish. He sees these Christians. He thinks they're vulnerable. He thinks they're weak. But these are people who've laid down their lives for Jesus. He goes after them, and they have to scatter he thinks he's winning. He thinks he's feasting. But what happens? They begin to spread the good news of Jesus Christ throughout Judea and Samaria. They have to go into the Decapolis, into Roman territory, in order to get up to Judea and come back around to Samaria. They start talking about Jesus everywhere. Oops, he goofed. Shouldn't have gone after Stephen. Too late. Moving God's story forward. And then godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church going from house to house. He dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. And now Paul's mindset is the mindset of a man who is in love with the church. But he doesn't, he doesn't really know God because he hasn't learned to know and love Jesus Christ. And Satan thinks, oh good, I've got one. He's going to be my, my other coyote, you know. And he, but what happens to Saul? What happens to Saul? On the way to Damascus, Jesus, he encounters Jesus Christ. 
And Jesus says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? I'm Jesus. And Saul's mind, that resurrection power hits Saul's mind, and Saul's mind starts to, to change the renewing of his mind, and he becomes sold out for Jesus Christ. He gives up his life for Jesus Christ, and Paul becomes the apostle to the Gentiles. He hated Christians, and he hated Romans. And the mind of Christ made him love and become a Christian and love Romans with the love, the, the whole Roman world with the love of Jesus Christ. You cannot stop God's story from moving forward. And when you're a person who's laid down your life for Jesus, he can use you to the full. When we lay down our lives for Jesus, when we're completely and totally immersed in love and for and with him, nothing the enemy does can stop the purposes of Christ to save and restore. When we surrender to Jesus, God's face shines on us. When we fall completely in love with Jesus, the Holy Spirit keeps filling us again and again. What the enemy means for evil, God turns for good. And if God is for us, who can stand against us? Amen? Right now and every day, we can surrender ourselves to the love of Jesus Christ. Right now and every day, we can fall more deeply in love with him. Every moment, every challenge, every conflict, every time that the enemy bites, we have the opportunity to be even more surrendered to Jesus, more used for the glory of God, more powerful in our testimony, and more forgiving and more forgiven and more renewed and more restored. Paul, Paul the guy who hated the Christians and approved of the murder of Stephen, said this, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. That is the transformation of the mind that happens when we surrender our lives to Jesus Christ. When the enemy bites, don't buckle, surrender to Jesus. See, when he bites and you feel like giving up, good, give up, but don't give up to him, give up to Jesus. When the world punches or the enemy punches, don't punch back. I'm one of these guys. I'm a trained martial artist. I have no flight bone in my body. I'm a fight guy. But when somebody offends me, when the world attacks, when the enemy attacks, my instinct is to fight. But what I need to do is to hang on to Jesus. And when you hold on to Jesus, which is against every instinct in your natural body, and you lay down your instincts, and you lay down your life, and you hang on to him, the Holy Spirit will fill you through him, and through him, you will become a loving, kind, peacemaking, gentle, amazingly powerful person on earth, but of the kingdom of God. When the enemy bites, he gets the hook because you have laid down your life. He is risen. Hope is rising. Oh, Amen. Let's pray. Jesus, all I can say is I love you. We love you. I pray that we all lay down our lives for you. Use us, Lord Jesus, to move into your next, the next part of your big story in Jesus' name. Amen.